Hello, today we are here to talk. We are here talking about public history, and today we are in our connection with Australia. Our special guest uh, is Paul Ashton. He has been working with uh, public history for a long time, and he's here to talk with us today. Uh, Paul, first of all, thank you very much to be here in this connection between Rio de Janeiro and Sydney, Australia, and well, that's it. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, uh, to start our conversation, I would like to ask you uh, a little definition about public history. Sure. Um, <clears throat> public history, is, as I'm sure you'll all know, um, is a very fluid um, term um, and it's still being debated. Um, basically, I define public history as the, the practice and representation of history um, outside of the academy. Um, in various modes um, and I, I also um, think that public history is something that's not just undertaken by academically trained historians. Um, public history um, is, is done by a whole range of people from novelists and filmmakers who might not see themselves necessarily as a historian but their work is based in history in historical research and thinking and it reaches big audiences and has very big impacts um, so i have a very democratic idea of what constitutes public history i see it more as a spectrum uh, as as a, as a horizontal thing rather than something vertical or like a pyramid with academics on the top and everyone else below them in this chain of historical being. So um, I really think it's important uh, that we we consider public history in that broad way that brings in communities, um, ethnic minorities, uh, a whole range of groups uh, that are actively uh, practicing um, public history in some form or another. And I think politically that's very important because as Raph Samuel, I'm, I'm sure you all know Raphael Samuel's work, Theatres of Memory, was arguing in the, in the 1990s that history uh, it, it was in danger then and is in great danger now. In universities in Australia, for example, history departments are disappearing. Um, in the 1970s, there were over 2,000 academic historians in Australia. Now there's about 500. And we really need, I think, to think more democratically about the practice of history, if for no other reason, to shore it up politically. Yeah, that's true. And I would uh, ask you, after this short definition, uh, the main differences between public history, uh, the universe extension, the science Outreach. Um, yes, it's. Yeah, um, I, I sort of, in a sense, don't see public history as an outreach. Um, I see it more as academics trying to engage themselves with a broader community of historians. So I use the metaphor in a book that Paula Hamilton and I published called Australian, it's called History at the Crossroads, Australians in the Past. And it was based on a national survey we did early in the 21st century to look at how Australians use the past, think about it and use it in their daily lives. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm not really looking at history in a sense as an, as an outreach, I'm looking um, as <clears throat> a, a public history uh, working to engage with communities. And I think the word engagement is really important. Uh, it's something that's been grappled with in universities, I think, all over the world. I'm sure 
in your country too, where universities are, are being asked to engage with publics, engage with communities. Um, and I think there's a very strong role there for public history. Um, even um, in terms of, um, we've all heard of um, a citizen science, where, where people are engaged in scientific activities, whether it's environmental science or whatever. Um, and I think citizen history is something that um, would, is, is actually developing. And I think we need to sort of consider pathways like that to um, expand the practice of public history. And yeah, th there is all the stuff that we can be closer of the community to do public history and which uh, strategies, uh, another uh, ways to do public history that, uh, for example, you suggest or along uh, of your career that you did to practice the public history? Yes, um, we, we established a centre for the Australian Centre for Public History in 1999 and we've tried to use that centre. It's still going. Um, uh, we've tried to use that centre um, to engage with communities and to undertake a whole range of different projects. So we've worked on community oral history. We've done commissioned history with local government. Uh, we've worked in um, museums. Um, we worked in Sydney, a very fun project. Uh, and I think fun is a really important word because we are dealing with very serious subjects and issues, but I think it's really important to to make the process enjoyable. So we were approached by an Italian cultural organisation called Coazit, and they this is early 2000s, and they said, we would really like to do a project with your centre, and they wanted to look at what we call fruit shops, Fruit shops are where you go and buy fruit and vegetables. And a lot of Italians, when they migrated here after World War I, um, a lot of them, because they came from agricultural backgrounds, set up shops to sell fruit and vegetables. So they would go to the market, big market, very early in the morning, buy fruit and vegetables, bring them back and sell them through their shop. So when I grew up as a young boy, our suburb had a fruit shop and everyone knew the Italian fruit shop, uh, husband and wife and their kids. Um, and every suburb in Sydney had a fruit shop. So we had a project where we, we spent eight years working with the communities, training uh, them to do oral history. We did oral history as well. We collected hundreds of photographs from um, uh, uh, families and we published academic articles, um, newspaper articles, we did radio interviews, and at the very end of the project in 2009, we put on an exhibition in the City of Sydney Council's big exhibition hall at Circular Quay, in the, right in the gateway of Sydney, um, an exhibition on fruit shops, and it had um, banners and, and artefacts and, and uh, sound loops and something like 15,000 people saw that exhibition over three or four months and it was so popular. It wasn't a big exhibition. It was a medium size. It travelled around the state we live in called New South Wales for three years and that was a great example of how I think you can actually work in public history produce academic outcomes, but also community outcomes and things that have significant impact. There was something like, I think, 50 visitor books where you go and see a museum and you can write, this was bloody terrible, or I really enjoyed this. And there were very, very positive comments in those um, books too. So that's the sort of thing we try and do. Uh, we have, for example, uh your work uh, and people uh, from history around the world, they working to divulge uh, history. But how uh, compete, how can or how could we compete with the 
power, uh, economical power of some politicians uh, with some inf fake information on the social networks and sometimes even movies that there are a lot of movies that they show they work with history but uh the historians can see the mistakes that they do so how can we compete with this big economic power it's a very good question <clears throat> and and one that is is in some ways difficult to answer but i, I think this is why engagement and democratization is an important thing that that the more people we can get involved in history making and thinking about historical subjects, um, the, the more critical they will become and the more aware of the need to think carefully about what they're watching, what it's based on, who's who's saying it, um, who's not involved, who's excluded. Um, and I think, again, the example of that fruit shop exhibition, although it was very playful, and fun. Um, it was very serious about migration. Um, it looked at racism. So, for example, uh, we talked to one old Italian lady who said she and her husband during World War II had, had put their um, naturalisation certificates in the window, the front window of their fruit shop, so people wouldn't throw rocks through it. Or, or damage their shop or hurt them because they're Italians and we're at war with Italy. So they, they were very conscious of the fact they had to um, in, um, show very clearly they were Australians. So you can look at a whole range of very critical, important and difficult issues, I think, through these sorts of things. Um, and, and, and trying to um, counter false history, fake history, I think all we can really do is try to work um, as hard as we can in areas that are publicly visible. And one of the problems, I think, with, with some academic history is that it is invisible. It's published in, in arenas that people, normal people don't visit and they don't read it. So um, um, I like to brag a little bit. We, we do a journal called Public History Review, which is 20, it's 30 years old this year. And we have it on an open access, free online journal system through UTS ePress. And it has over 3000 readers in over 90 countries. So I think it's very important we talk, talk about impact and access uh, and engagement. Um, to make sure we're getting out there and um, yeah, and telling our stories. Yeah, and another uh, thing that I will ask you is that some words and expressions they are uh, too much present on our uh, society, like fake news, uh, negation news, historical revision news, and how it affects uh history and how uh, public history can i will not say stop it but can break can stop a little bit this kind of stuff that we have been living today yes absolutely <clears throat> um i think in terms of things like fake history and and political interference we have a national uh, prize for history uh, that the, our Prime Minister um, oversees. And we had a very conservative Prime Minister called John Howard. And at one point, the committee that were giving the prize to the hit, to the hit best history book on Australian history, the Prime Minister didn't like their choice. So instead of one prize, he made them give two. And he made them give a prize to a very conservative book that had a very narrow and quite twisted focus. So that level of interference in historical nar narrative in Australia goes from the very highest level right down. Um, we have a, a, a 
series of history awards in our state, New South Wales, the Premier's History Awards. Um, I've been on the some of the panels for that for a number of years, and I'm very happy to say that I've never experienced any political interference there, but there has been in other state awards. Um, um, but again, I think the main thing um, is to uh, practice history in a very public way uh, and in an impactful way that gets our messages out there. Um, and, and also being uh, brave in terms of engaging with corruption or lies, outright lies, and just having to be brave about it. And that can be very difficult politically, um, particularly if you're working in, say, a university where there can be all sorts of ramifications. So it's been, about, been very streetwise um, in, that, in that sense. I will do a question for you uh, with a name of a book that you wrote. And what's public history globally? Yes, um, <clears throat> interesting you mentioned that. When, when I approached Bloomsbury um, to publish the book, which they were very happy to do, and they issued a contract within days, um, they wanted me to call the book, What is Global Public History? And I said to them, no, we're going to call it What is Public History Globally? Because I don't think there is a global public history. I think what we've got is a series of practices, some of which are similar, some of which are different, depending on where you are, your political circumstances, the culture you work in, um, so we, we have a, a public history practice, um, a, a public history is practiced across the world, but I don't think there is a, a homogeneous um, practice. It, it does differ across places and across time as well. So I, I was very conscious about moving that word global to the end of the title. So what is public history globally? to not try to, to avoid um, saying that there is a global public history. Uh, and I, I, I don't think there is particularly. And that's why when I did that book with Alex Trapeznik, who's a public historian in New Zealand and who's also a historian of Russia, Russian history, we had the first section of the book has, I think, 11 or 12 chapters what is public history in India, Indonesia, um, uh, Scandinavia, Britain, America, Canada, New Zealand, a whole range of countries. And a colleague of mine um, actually said to me at one point, why didn't you get the people that wrote those chapters to write about this and that and the other thing? And I said, I didn't want to impose my ideas of what public history is on them I wanted them to tell us what public history is in their country and how they see it. And if you look at those chapters carefully, there's some very interesting nuanced differences in, the, in those different chapters. And it's because of the culture uh, and historical backgrounds and the way history is practiced in academia. And as I'm sure you'll all know, um, <clears throat> for example, history in parts of Europe historians are obliged to present themselves almost as scientists because that's how the academy reads academic practice. So they often have a lot of jargon and develop, I think, quite unnecessary theoretical frameworks because they need to be seen by the academy as being scientific. And um, I, I don't really think any academic discipline is, is particularly scientific. It's all driven by ideology and fashion and economics and a whole lot of things. Um, but again, it was interesting getting those chapters back and um, and seeing how it, 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 it's different. Um, yeah, I, even the chapter on Indian public history is very interesting too, because it, it entered into areas about caste, Indian caste, um, um, which was quite interesting to see too. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, and on other countries, uh, for example, in you can find, for example, uh, large differences between the kind of public history that people uh, do in India and in the in the United States. Uh, England, for example, uh, has some difference between the other other parts of Europe. So mm -hmm. the same your course on public history, how this works? It, it's a very good question. Um, and I think if you look at the historical traje trajectories of public history in different countries, it's, it's important to, to understand the historiographical evolution of, of the practice. So in England, for example, public history really emerges out of um, local history and labor history with Raphael Samuel, the history workshop movement. So it's really a grassroots um, socialist based um, undertaking. The funny thing in Britain, but is when you look at it, people don't talk about public history in Britain until the mid 1990s. So that's when Hilda Keen set up and, and started running the first public history program at Ruskin College in Oxford. And Ruskin is a working man's college, a working class college in, in Oxford. Um, <clears throat> so public history emerged much later and much slower in Britain than in, for example, Australia or Canada. Um, uh, and again, for different political reasons, historical reasons that um, again, labor history and, and socialist history was basically doing the job of public history in Britain. So it was a similar thing, but called a different name. Um, in Australia, we adopted um, the, the tradition of public history, both in England through the history workshop movement, but also there was a strong American flavor as well amongst some practitioners. In, when I first went to America in the 1990s, the late 1990s, um, I got the very distinct impression that most American public historians only saw public history as something that ba basically was American. And so a lot of American public historians have a very narrow view of what public history is. And they seem to think that it emanated out from, from America to other countries. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think public history was growing in different ways in different places for a very long time. And in fact, I think if we go back to the late 19th century, we can see that the people that initiated what we call public history today were amateurs. They weren't academics. And academic history after World War II has actually taken over a lot of activities and practices that people in communities uh, or wealthy amateurs were doing for generations, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think in, in the States, <clears throat> there are quite a few people in the Society for Local History, the American Society for Local History, um, get very upset with some academic public historians because they say, hey, We've been doing this for a hundred years, and you guys just turned up last week. What are you talking about? So, um, so there are tensions there too in that movement. So it's a very long movement with a very, um, a, a, a very uh, checkered um, history, and there, there is a radical stream going through those public history practices that isn't acknowledged sometimes, but I, I think um, there is a very strong radical theme going through there. So in Australia, we basically um, have a core of public historians that are professional historians who work in heritage or museums or conservation, or some community history <clears throat> that are politically in the middle of the road. Then we have some conservative public historians um, uh, and then a, a, a small number of radical public historians who work with land rights, with Aboriginal groups, um, who are pushing political agendas very hard. And they say uh, quite openly, we are activists. We are acting with for our publics. 
I have one former student of mine who's brilliant and she works mainly with Aboriginal people and she just says, tell me what to do. You tell me what the ethics are and the protocols of research and I will work with you. I won't, won't work on you. Um, we, we will work as a collective and she's wonderful and she works um, on land rights and a whole range of, of areas with um, community, Aboriginal communities in our state here in New South Wales. And if we, we do, if we uh, decide to do a kind of overview of uh, public history on the last years, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, uh, it's growing too much, right? It's the same on, uh, happening on Australia, I guess it's around the world, right? Yes, I think you're exactly right. Um, uh, uh, public history, from my point of view, from the early 21st century has taken off. Um, in Britain, it, it really boomed from around 2010. Uh, there was a, there's a, a national public history council or committee that was only set up in about 2012, something like that. I can't remember exactly. <clears throat> so it, I think in the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen a, a massive boom in public history everywhere. Eastern Europe, very big. There's a lot of Russian public history coming out now, a, a huge amount. Um, um, in fact, I can't keep up with the amount of public history that, that's that's flowing from all sorts of places. South America, um, and I, I suspect to one extent, <clears throat> it's partially a response to the growing conservative political climate that we're all living in, um, uh, and that people, a, a lot of people are wanting to, uh, to make their own histories. And I think the other thing is that the digital revolution from the mid 1990s has allowed all sorts of people to explore history, to research. <clears throat> For example, in the 1970s and 60s and 70s here, if you wanted to do work about convicts and imperialism, and you would need to go to the British Library um, and look at the records of the colonial secretary. Now, it, it, when, before the internet, you had to have time and money to do that. So it was mainly academics um, doing it. Uh, from the, the rise of the, the, the laptop computer, the um, personal computer and the internet, um, personal computers, late 70s, internet, mid, mid 90s, uh, I think that's had an incredible revolutionary impact on, on who can do history and how they can do it. Um, Yes, that's true, and especially the last two years here, uh, too much people using, uh, for example, Instagram and all the stuff to to do history. Yes. To Absolutely. yes, the pandemic times, they uh, get a kind of um, a kind of. Uh, but it started increase the the movement increase and I guess people started to use all the stuff and had the time because we had to stay home to yep. a lot of facts. And yes, no, no, absolutely. I published a piece, an article last year in Public History Review by Meg Foster and Peter Hobbins and a couple of other people. And it actually looks at how the, the pandemic changed the way that people and public institutions looked at historical practice. And it's quite interesting. And as you say, it had a major impact on, on, on a personal public history practices of people, but also of institutional <clears throat> approaches. So a lot of institutions started putting up uh, web pages saying, tell us what you're doing at home. Um, how are you experiencing the pandemic? How's it changed your life? So there'll be a lot of really interesting material around uh, from this time for people in the future to look back and see the impact of the pandemic on the practice of, of history generally. 
Yeah, yeah, here uh, appeared some projects to people, for example, uh, recording their uh, and talking about their experience between uh, during this uh, pandemic times, for example. Yes. Yeah. Especially to the next generation uh, yeah. to see how we live it uh, all this. Uh, time uh, with this pandemic and how crazy stuff how how our lives changed uh with this uh coronavirus absolutely absolutely um one of the things i've been doing just as an aside to to tell you um one of the things i've been doing the last few years is that i've i've stopped working full-time in academia and, but I'm still doing a lot of history work. But I've started writing children's history books, a creative nonfiction. <clears throat> I've written 33 5,000 word books, little books, um, on, on serious historical subjects, but trying to deal with issues, critical issues like race um, and gender and a whole lot of stuff by using stories, some of which are funny, some of which are sad. Um, I look at shipwrecks in the 19th century um, and, and their implications and try and get people to think about how people thought about uh, things like travel in the 19th century. If you got on a, a boat, you would be excited to go somewhere, but you would also be very dreading the possibility of drowning because there were so many shipwrecks. In Australia in the 19th century, there were about 5,000 shipwrecks <clears throat> A lot and a lot of people drowned but um <clears throat> i've also been doing things like trying to mix fantasy and and fun into the story so i have one story called anna and the cult of the dead and it's about a little girl whose great grandmother is italian she came to australia in after world war ii i made this up but it's based on real stories and her mother is part of a, a, a cult in Naples that from the 1870s went into the catacombs where all the, the bodies were buried from the plagues and they adopted skulls. And, the, and it's still a big cult in Naples today. And so women, working class women would adopt a skull. They would clean it and take it presents and give it flowers and little candles. And they, a lot of them claim that the spirit of the dead person came to them in their sleep and would tell them their name. <clears throat> and so I've got this story about this young girl who's very similar to her great-grandmother, um, her, her grandmother, but who had adopted a soul and the soul had adopted her. But when the grandmother dies, the soul adopts the granddaughter and it's, it's quite wacky in one way, but it talks about um, the Catholic religion, things like purgatory, um, Halloween, where that came from, because uh, all, all Souls Day, and a whole lot of things. And it ends up in Sydney, in, in contemporary Sydney. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways that we can be more creative <clears throat> in trying to talk about complex and interesting and critical and difficult issues through different mediums. And as an academic, I didn't have time to write uh, creative nonfiction stories. My, my boss would have beaten me around the head and said, what the hell are you doing? Go and write an article. Um, but now I've got the time. And, and I think if academic practitioners, if they're in flexible working environments, should think about doing different sorts of modes of history to get it out to broader audiences. Um, so I, I also write textbooks for our national mandatory history syllabus and, and they sell an average of 50,000 copies a textbook, which is a lot of books. And so that sort of penetration and impact, I think, is very important. Yeah, because sometimes we talk about uh, kind of comfort zones or zone of comfort, but uh, 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 the, the pe people, society, uh they they are on uh on this kind of uh zone but sometimes the academicals uh are in the same comfort zone we know how hard it is to write a book 
or uh, an academic uh, article, but it's hard to you go to society and start a project uh, to divulgate history. It takes too much time. It uh, sometimes well the, the the dedication that you have to to the project is too hard. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and <clears throat> academics like yourself too, you've got teaching and administration and a whole range of other things that, <clears throat> that bog you down. And at the moment in Australia, the tertiary environment here is getting harder and harder with the pandemic. A lot of universities here um, have become totally managerialist. They're very conservative. Um, and what they have done is they've used the pandemic to actually take what was going to be 10 year plans to go totally online and push the plans into a year or two. So they've just said to the staff, oh, you know, you're now not teaching 100 students, you're teaching 200. All online, the ac young academics in the faculty I'm working with have no offices anymore. All their offices have been taken away. So they, they don't have an office. Um, so that there's a, a lot of change. And I think in Australia, within five to 10 years, your average undergraduate degree here will be very similar to what we call doing the high school certificate. So there, there's going to be a massive, <clears throat> a, a massive increase in the number of people at universities, and there will be a corresponding decrease in the overall quality of undergraduate degrees. And that's where I see it going at the moment. Um, and this is about the rise of vocationalism from the 1990s and managerialism. So universities are going to be a very difficult place, I think, for history to operate in. And this is why I think public history is a critical, um, <clears throat> a, a critical practice for historians in the academy, because it's a way of making them re themselves relevant um, and engaging politically with a broad range of communities. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's taken off in the last decade or two. It's not a coincidence that the rise of managerialism and vocationalism in universities has also seen a rise in public history. I think it's been, an, it's tried to counter um, those, those um, um, less positive and developments. Uh, talking about Australia, I would ask you uh, about to ask you to tell us a little bit about the Australia Australian Center for Public History. Sure. Well, we, as I mentioned, we set it up in 1999, um, and some other historians here were a little bit cross about it because we called it the Australian Centre for Public History, not the UTS Centre. So we wanted we wanted actually to say to the world, we're Australians and we're doing public history. Um, um, I'm actually the only professor of public history in Australia, uh, formally titled. Um, so I'm the best because I'm the only one. So there you are. <laughs> But our, our, our centre set out uh, with Paula Hamilton and, and myself, we, we set out to actually um, public, publicly practice history outside the university. So we were very active in engaging with communities, with the Italian community, with indigenous communities. We used to work with the parks service here in, a, in New South Wales. <clears throat> so we would run workshops for indigenous rangers in parks, in national parks, to do oral history and a whole range of things. Um, and we, we were very active in generating grants. So Australians in the past was probably one of the bigger grants that we got. And it was modelled on the David Thielen and Roy Rosenzweig, um, uh, the presence of the past, you know, that book, the presence of the past, where they did a huge survey in America with about 1,500 respondents <clears throat> about um, how people in America use the past, think about it politically, emotionally, a whole range of things. 
and they put a book out and we we met them and talked to them and we decided that we would replicate their study in Australia. So we did Australians in the past and we interviewed um, 350 people on the phone, 150 face-to-face interviews across the country over three years and wrote a number of books and articles about Australians in the past comparing it to America and then after that, uh, Canadian people came to us and said, we want to replicate your study. So there's been a project called Canadians in the Past, and we went to Canada and met them at the University of um, British Columbia, and we gave them workshops basically about what we did wrong. So don't do this, do that, it's, it's better. They did a fantastic survey, and they have a book out called Canadians in the Past that came out about five years, six years ago. We also had a PhD student from Singapore who came to work with us. She was at the National Museum of Singapore and she did a PhD on Singaporeans in the past. Now there's currently a project being developed in Scandinavia to look at Scandinavians in the past. And uh, I'm currently working with Tanya Evans at Macquarie University on doing revisiting Australians in the past 20 years later to see what the pandemic, what digital developments have impacted on how people use the past. We're just putting in an Australia Research Council grant for that now, and we hope that it will get uh, funding and that we can actually do more research for that. So our centre um, was very, very active, um, and Paula and I in the last um, 25 years have um, supervised 60 PhD students to completion. My, my hair used to be your colour <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would like to ask you uh, 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 in about the academic uh, exchange. Uh, how, uh, which countries, uh, Australia, uh, have more connection, and because you told us uh, Singapore, Canada, United States. So, which are the main countries that uh, you do this exchange, uh, academic exchange? It's pr- probably <clears throat> the United States and Canada and Britain are probably the three main ones. <clears throat> we have some very strong connections, but in Scandinavia. Pardon me, I'll just have a quick drink. No, no, no problem. Thank you. I, I, I was prepared to <laughs> I have <laughs> and my bottle right oh, here. <laughs> that's great. We um I've I've also um have some uh, we also have some strong connections in India. Um uh, I taught for three weeks in the University of Missouri about three years ago, which was fascinating. It's the only university in it's a very small landlocked state in India, very poor. Um, but uh, I taught a public history program there for master's students for three weeks. And it was an Indian government program that they, they um, sponsored me to go, go there. Um, we work with New Zealanders as well. Um, Alex, the guy I co-edited the what is public history globally book is a New Zealander. But New Zealand's a very small country. There's only about six million people and there's only five, I think, universities in the whole country. <clears throat> so Alex is at Otago and that's the, the there's a couple of public history programs there that are that are good. Um, I've also we we also worked have worked very early Paula worked with some Italian people in Clio Media um, in Italy. And we I wasn't at the university at the time, but Paula Hamilton and um, Anne Kerthoys, who's a very well-known senior Australian academic historian <coughs> who works in, in race and, and other things, Paula and, uh, and Anne set up the public history program at UTS and it opened in 1988. And they they paid Clio Media to consult and help them develop the public history program because we didn't want to do an American-style public history program where it was mainly 
white middle class um, heritage based work uh, commissioned history we wanted to look at um, things like media uh, and creative non-fiction novels documentaries um, a whole range of things not an oral history and memory studies not just very traditional um, public history um, uh, things so there was a public history program set up at Monash University the same year, 1988. Graham Davidson ran that. Very good program, but it was very different to the UTS program. The UTS program was more, um, not postmodern, but it was it was more uh, theoretical and more cutting edge. Um, I think Monash was a fairly traditional public history program, more styled along an American style. Um, um, program. Um, so we, we, we basically tried to make connections with anyone and everyone that we could um, and and take up opportunities to to develop joint projects and we've done a lot over the years. So um, yeah. It's really, really nice to hear. Um, going to the end of our talk, uh, I will ask I will ask you your final considerations. Um, basically, I, I see a, um, I think a positive future for public history. <clears throat> um, it is growing, it continues to grow rapidly. Uh, and I think there are growing numbers of opportunities for um, graduates um, to, to work. And I think <clears throat> I always say to my doctoral and master's students that are doing public history that you need to be flexible and creative in thinking about how you can work as a historian in public history. Um, and if you're going to be freelance, you need to be very versatile. Well, I was freelance for 12 years as a, as a working historian outside of academia. <clears throat> And so I learned to write textbooks for big mandatory syllabus, to, to work in museum exhibitions, um, do heritage reports um, and a whole range of things. And I, I, I think there's just growing opportunities. One thing, uh, I've got a doctoral student writing a <coughs> thesis at the moment on history in, herit in, in heritage interpretation. And her argument is that historians in Australia have been totally marginalised in heritage interpretation. It's dominated by architects and people involved with physical remains. Uh, and I think there are opportunities for, for public historians to become far more active in areas of the culture like heritage interpretation um, and to make history more uh, centre or more prominent uh, and I think history making and place making are still very important things and they can have economic impact on communities that are poor by using story and a whole range of things. And this student of mine runs a heritage interpretation firm in Melbourne and she works in Malaysia and India and a whole range of places where they work with poorer communities and with government <clears throat> in using history and culture to generate economic renewal uh, and prosperity. So I think I think there's a lot of things that we could could keep working on and thinking about. Okay, Paul, it was uh, really nice to hear you, to talk with you, hear about all these experiences, all these cases involving public history and in big picture history or professional. Uh, and thank you very much for your time to be here uh, with us. Uh, I have to say thank you to the audience, uh, people that are watching us now and the people that will watch our talk later because YouTube, uh, the, the talk stay there. The video that we are doing right now will stay here and people uh, can watch later. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's lovely speaking with you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.